As a programmer, picking the right name for something can be difficult. What actually makes for a good name for a variable, a function, a file, a module, a class, or even a database table? In this video, I'll talk about why naming is important, and I'll show four different best practices and four different anti-patterns that will make your life a lot easier, because for the most part, they're easy rules to follow. Let's talk about how to name things in code. Part 1. Why is naming important? It all boils down to the following. The reader of code has less context and less knowledge than the writer of code. While you are writing code, you have all the solution design in your head, you have the intricacies, the details, you have all the knowledge in the context, therefore you can implement the solution. It is required to have that kind of knowledge before you can implement a working solution. But as a reader of code, you don't know all these details. And as a writer of code, you should empathize with the reader because they don't know these details, so you'll have to make it extra clear for them. When you are reading code, you have less context for various reasons. It could be you a year from now who has forgotten all the details. It could also be a different person. It doesn't matter whether it's a junior just joining the team or a senior who has just not seen this part of code yet. They are missing the context, so reading this code will take them two, three, four times as much time to just understand what's going on. Code gets read more a lot than it gets written, probably 10 times more. So logically, we should optimize our code for readability. That means the reader takes priority over the writer. That means shaving off extra character, picking shorter variable names, all these kind of decisions are suddenly not an option anymore because they solve a problem for the writer, not for the reader. Picking the right name requires some discipline from the writer. Yes, it's easier to write less characters when naming a new variable, but that's optimizing for the writer, not for the reader. Yes, it will cost you extra time to come up with exactly the right word, but it's vital that you take that time. And luckily, we're only talking about seconds here. A good name reveals purpose. For a variable, that means what data is stored in it. For a function, a module, or a class, it means what it does. In object-oriented programming, a class mixes the concern of functionality and data in one, and therefore it is more important and more difficult to come up with a good name of a class. And in functional programming, they have separated the concerns of functionality and data, and therefore it's more natural to come up with two different names, yielding more easier naming and more declarative code. So good naming is important because it speeds us up. You won't need to further look at the details and zoom into the implementation details to understand what's going on. It's also more important because it decreases the chance of misunderstanding code. The assumptions our brain make are often more correct when we write code with good names. And not all assumptions we make get validated, so this leads to fewer misinterpretations. Next, let's look at the best practices and the anti-patterns of naming things. The first best practice I want to talk about is using a noun for data. With data I mean variables, simple and complex variables. Pick a noun. A name needs to be descriptive and short to be to the point. A noun is as to the point as you can get. In here I've got two examples. The first one specifies this object is user data. And as a reader, we'd like to empathize with the reader of the code, not the writer. This could be anything. There could be any sorts of data that is user data. Is it metadata of the user? Is it core data? How should I interpret this? What kind of things are in there? If you're looking at the source code of this itself, of course you know this, but often this variable user data is used somewhere else in a function and you won't look at the source code. So to be able to make assumptions around it, you need to start looking at the source code. That is diving deeper that we want to prevent. A better way of doing this would be to be very specific. Split this up into two different variables. There is an address part of the user and there is an access log entry. Maybe there's a lot more, but this is the relevant part. Now I have two very specific names. If I see the name user address or user access log entry somewhere else outside of the context uh, of this specific example, then I will still know what it means. I will be able to make more correct assumptions about it. And the second one is that functionality should be a verb. Data is something, functionality does something. We're describing an action or a transition of state. With functionality, I mean functions, classes, modules, anything that does something, which is different from data. When we're working with functionality, we're often describing a transition from this state to this state. There's this thing is happening. What is the name of that action? If we can come up with a short word, an imperative way of saying this is the action that is happening, that's always a better term. I like plan event instead of event planner or activate user account. 
and not user account updater. Because you're not describing what something is, you're describing what something does. And you can ask yourself this question, am I describing what it does? Or you could start a sentence with I. I activate user account. Let's look at an example. I've got a few functions here. The first one is the bad example and the second uh, one are the good examples. Normalize and capitalize are verbs. They're active imperative statements. They're short and to the point. Tags could be anything combined with the fact that anything could be inside an object. Yes, it's probably doing something with tags inside that object, but what is it actually doing? Is it retrieving? Is it updating? Is it deleting? There's no action in there. And my third best practice is using longer names. That means using full words and maybe even short sentences to describe what something does. Really, it is okay to use longer names. We're not paying by the bite here. In general, longer names are more descriptive and therefore they aid the reader. They make interpretation easier and assumptions less often wrong. Let's look at an example. I've got a match function and I've got a is match namesake contains code function. This seems like a very long name to some people, but it really isn't. These two implementations do exactly the same. The only thing that's different is the naming. Instead of simply having characters and a string, this is a very specific function. It's from the objects A and B, it takes a code and it takes a namesake. So why not say this is the cleaned namesake? These are letters that we're, that we're dealing with here. The code is being split and these, what comes out is letters. So when I read this, it makes more sense. Are the letters included in the namesake? This again is the same function as this one, but now it has a name included in namesake. We are talking about letter here. It's not any character, it is a letter. And we're checking whether it's included in the namesake. So this is very generic, but it actually isn't a generic function because it relies on very specific properties on objects. So let's give it specific names as well. My fourth best practice is to stick to the convention. If you're using a programming language or a certain library or framework where it's common to use underscores as separators in names, this is common in Python, I believe, then stick to that. If you're using a language where everything is Pascal cased or camel cased or whatever, stick to that. If you don't have a certain style guide that you committed to as a team, then maybe it's worth looking one up and sticking to that. There's usually naming guidelines, naming conventions in those style guides as well. Take the Airbnb JavaScript style guide. There is a section on naming conventions. Avoid naming like this, do things like that. There's all kinds of rules that you can adhere to that will make your code easier to scan. Let's talk about anti-patterns next. And the first one is using names that are too short, specifically one character, one length names for variables or functions and abbreviations that are really short. Using names that are too short forces the reader into either guessing and assuming its meaning or having to dive deeper into the implementation, looking up all the details to know what's going on. Let's take a look at this formula. If you find this somewhere in some code as part of a bigger formula, you, you don't know what R stands for, potentially, if you don't recognize immediately the formula, if it's not something mathy that you're very familiar with. So for a lot of people, it makes sense to just add these few characters, call it a radius. Even better, extract this into a variable and replace the inline expression with the variable name. Now it makes even more sense to the reader. There are a few exceptions to this rule. One of them is the variable i inside a for loop. That's such a common convention, people will know what that means. Another exception I can think of is a generic function like this. The variable n and the variable f clearly make a lot of sense. You can call this number number and function function, but that doesn't add a lot of value. There isn't anything more you can say about this specific number. It just has to be a number and for it's going to loop over it and call it. This says run multiple times. There's an n and an f, number and a function. There isn't any more context you can give here. Again, i here makes sense in the context of a for loop and n and f are clearly typed. You can't get more specific in this case. The second thing I would avoid is using types in variable names. If you have a statically typed language, then the type can often be read in the code. It's next to the variable name. And even if you have type inference or the type definition is somewhere else, or you have a very implicit typed language, then you can probably get the answer from your editor by putting your mouse over the variable and it's printing a, a tooltip for you with all kinds of information on the type. 
there are a few exceptions to this rule, I would say. One of them being having a dynamically typed language coupled with having generic code. Normally, I would try to encode a purpose in a variable name, but the definition of generic code is that it can be used for multiple purposes. So what name are you going to give it? Let's look at an example here. I've got a function that has a very clear purpose. This is a verb and the, the name of the function looks fine. But these variables, string, uh, character, they are not specific. They don't encode a purpose. In fact, they're a type. Why would I use this? Because it is very difficult to guess what purpose this replace diacritics function will be used for. Why do the diacritics need to be replaced in this? Is it an address? Does it need to be printed by an old printer on a shipping label and that doesn't support, I don't know, diacritics in a, in a certain way that the German language needs? That is a very specific example I just invented that could be the case for this string, but there could be many other reasons for which you might want to use this function. So it is a generic function and thus using a type in here because we don't have a clue of its purpose yet and it can be used for multiple ones. It's fine in this case, you can break the rule. Another one in this function is adding the naming for string to array and array to string. Split and join come from the randa function. They are generic functions that can be run on multiple types. But now it's super clear how they're being used just in this function. The compiler can optimize this away. There's no disadvantage of doing this, no performance disadvantage. There's only a reader advantage. Suddenly they know if there's split and joins and maps and replays here, what it actually is about. The next thing I try to avoid is vagueness. Using vague words like util or lib or service or data, they're technically correct-ish, but they're not helpful at all for the reader. And that's again what we're trying to optimize for. I don't recommend using the word util not at all, but I think it's a good idea if there is, for example, a folder name and there's specific names underneath that. But having just one file called util.js with everything in it is not going to be helpful. The solution is simple. Specify further. Just add more details. Make it more specific. The last thing I recommend to avoid is magic numbers. A magical number is a number that could do anything. It's called that way because we don't understand it. The worst name you can have is no name at all. Let's look at an example. If you're reading this kind of code, it doesn't make sense for the reader. What, what is an eight minus one minus prefix? Why is there not a seven? The writer clearly has a purpose for this. Of course it is to, to, to split out these two different concepts. There's a max length, then there is a space length, and then we can do the calculation. There is no cost in adding these constants. There's only gain for the reader. Suddenly, this statement makes a lot more sense. To summarize, I like the approach of asking yourself this question when looking at your code. Could this be ambiguous for somebody? The point is to name things consciously, to think about a future, a future reader who comes into this code without any of the context that you have right now, could they quickly and easily understand it? Whether it's you a year from now or a new colleague tomorrow, doesn't matter. That's it. I hope this was helpful. I hope you liked it. If you have any thoughts or you have a request for a specific video in the future, please leave a comment and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching.